Hey, good afternoon and um, welcome to the final day of WOW, Wales One World Film Festival. Uh, I'm David Gillam, director of the festival, uh, and it's great to see so many uh, faces on this final event. Um, I mean, I've just come in from a sunny day in the garden, so I'm glad you're also giving up an hour or so of your time um, to join us for this event. Um, which is People and Forests, Wales and the Planet. Um, and really it's a chance to sort of open up and broaden the conversation that comes out from a couple of the films we've played this week, um, particularly um, The Hidden Life of Trees and um, Nothing But the Sun, um, the story of the Arroyo people in Paraguay. Um, and so we're really trying to look at what's going on here in Wales and also what's going on across the rest of the world uh, and give us that sense of the interdependence of, of, of all that, particularly around forests and trees and the climate. Um, so we are going to start uh, with Barbara Davis Quay from Size of Wales, who's going to give us uh, a quick introduction. Then there'll be a short film and Matthias Perez from the Forest Peoples Programme, who's kindly joined us from Lima in Peru. So thank you for that. Um, and then we shall go through the other speakers, um, David Williams from Loisy Coidwig and Holly from Kumarian, who is um, growing better connections in North Pembrokeshire. Um, so I think we'll start over to you, Barbara. Thank you, David. Um, thank you everyone for inviting us to the WOW Film Festival. We're really uh, pleased uh, to be here. Um, I work at Size of Wales, a small Welsh charity that was set up to secure and sustain a tropical forest at least the size of Wales as part of Wales's uh, fight against uh, climate change. And we're going to start off the programme today by seeing a short clip about the work that Size of Wales in partnership with Forest People Programme are doing in Peru in the Amazon. And it's showing the work of the One Piece indigenous people who for thousands of years have lived in the forest in the Amazon and have protected the precious forest. But um, they are facing grave threats and we are supporting them uh, to, to protect the forest, to protect nature and to to yeah, restore the forest that we have there. So we'll start with a short clip and then we'll hear some more from Matthias about the work that we're doing there. Peru, home to over 330,000 indigenous people. Indigenous ways of life have sustained the region's vast tropical forests for millennia. The Wampis, 15,000 people with a territory covering 1.3 million hectares. The Wampi's territory stores 145 million tonnes of carbon, 600% of Peru's commitment under the Paris Climate Agreement. The objective fundamental of the nation Wampi is to assume the defense of nature. Nature is a source of life for humanity. Because this territory where we are today parked is part of the planet Earth donde vivimos todos los seres humanos. Entonces tenemos que cuidar y eso es lo que hace la nación One Piece. However, illegal logging, gold mining, oil and gas extraction is threatening their forests and way of life. This has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. <laughs> A project by Size of Wales and the Forest People's Programme supports the Wampis to protect their lands. In 2015, they set up Peru's first autonomous indigenous government. New forest bylaws and forest management plans mean they can better manage their territory and take action against illegal exploitation. A new boat allows the community to attend important assemblies and meetings. Two successful legal victories led to oil company Geopark being forced to withdraw from the territory and the suspension of all oil and gas activities. They have also successfully prevented illegal gold mining and logging in their territory. Trained community forest monitors map deforestation on their territory using an interactive <laughs> online tool. The Wampis are also improving livelihoods opportunities with their natural resources. 
The Wampy's Breakfast Programme pilot uses locally sourced and culturally appropriate produce to feed school children. A sustainable fishing plan was created and fishing equipment and training were purchased. This opportunity has particularly benefited women and strengthened the community's resilience from these multiple pressures. Si nosotros los Wampis podemos trabajar para conservar todo este bosque y poder tener eh, lo que va a necesitar el mundo, podemos ser nosotros la despensa para la humanidad. As guardians and custodians of vital, biodiverse and sacred lands, it is essential that indigenous people's rights are respected. This must be a priority for upcoming global climate negotiations at COP26 in Glasgow in November 2021. Hello everyone, uh, can you hear me? Um, I wonder if we can have the slides from Peru, please. Okay, thank you. Um, well, good afternoon. Um, my name is Matias Perez, I'm from Peru. Uh, I'm working for the Forest People's Program, which is uh, an international human rights organization that uh, uh, seeks to, to work with uh, forest peoples to secure or protect the, the rights and territories and livelihoods. Next one, please. Well, it is, is, it is undeniable that we are in this sort of tipping point in, 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 in our history, in, in the collective history with, with all species on Earth, and which is basically driven by this uh, disruption or broken relationship with nature, which keeps going on and on with the increasing deforestation rates. And, and just with the pandemic, for example, um, uh, where states globally are, are, are pushing for rollbacks in terms of uh, social environmental safeguards uh, to reactivate economy uh, at the expense of primary forests, but as well as um, indigenous territories. Um, so uh, that's not exception of Peru, of course, um, from 2001 to 2019, according to the Global Forest Watch, we have lost 1.97 million hectares, hectares, which I think is uh, almost roughly the size of Wales, uh, which is 2 million of hectares, if I remember correctly. Um, but so that leads us to many questions uh, in terms of where to look or, or where we can grasp uh, examples or motivation uh, to, to rebuild this nature relationship we have lost or broken and 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 that's where it comes to the, the case of the one piece for example next one please well uh, as you have seen in the video the one piece is indigenous uh, people uh, located in the north part of peru where fpp and also the size of whale we work together with um it is about 85 communities, um, uh, 15,000 people in 1.3 million hectares of, of primary forest, basically. Um, and as, as you see in the video, they came up with this autonomous government in 2015, trying or seeking to achieve or uh, the exercise of self-determination in their territory and this paradigm of, of living well, or Wendibir or Tarimat Puhut. Um, and, so, so, but it has not been easy for the One Piece across the years. And, and uh, next one, please. You have many threads like oil, gas, exploration, exploitation, uh, top-down intervention from the state, illegal gold mining, timber extraction, illegal timber from for, of, of balsa wood, which is a, a soft wood um, coming or going from the One Piece territory towards the Ecuador markets. And of course, also we have uh, a state top-down intervention in terms of conservation or fortress conservation, as some we call it, uh, which does not respect the own local initiative of conservation. This is the last one in the in the lower right. 
is the intention of, of, the, of, of Peruvian state to, to expropriate part of the One Piece territory to create a natural protected area. Um, next one, please. Um, but One Piece are, 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 are showing along the years this, this, their different strategies of forest protection and also, which is important for us or for many of us, this, this sort of uh, 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 system of care related to nature, no? uh, these killing practices. Um, they are defending their territories, legal, comp uh, legal complaints, uh, advocacy campaigns, and withdrawing, pushing uh, oil companies or transnational oil companies to withdraw from, from their territory. Um, last, year, last year in July, there was uh, the sixth enterprise that in the period of at least 20 years, pull out from the territory after the fear resistance of the One Piece. Um, next one, please. Um, doing forest monitoring, of, of course, they know that their territory, the lakes, the rivers, and the streams, and, 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 and different type of forests. So they are using technology or tools to map and, and record, uh, coordinate uh, GPS points, uh, photos, and videos that can be used to create complaints and, and, and demands to push or uh, put pressure on the Peruvian state to um, uh, attack the illegal logging and gold mining and so on. Next one, please. Um, this is kind of a, a counter to counter the narrative of the state that is trying to expropriate a, a, um, a part of the portion of the One Piece territory, but in their statutes, the, the, the One Piece already classified this big mountain range, which is the core of their territory, which is a sacred place uh, as, a, as an intangible place. Uh, no One Piece communities are allowed in that place, according to them. So that's the question. Why, why cannot we learn or, 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 or strength or support the local initiative of doing conservation and, and rather than just coming with a fortress conservation and exclude indigenous people from the equation? Next one, please. Uh, Tiracam is an uh, is initiative um, that is it's a pilot that is happening in uh, one of the One Piece communities. Um, Tiracam means in, in, in One Piece language the kingfisher bird, which 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 takes what 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 only takes what needs to to, to survive. It doesn't take too much from from the from the na from nature in terms of fish. So it is um, like it's so in a beer, it's an, it's, a, it's an association of fishermen to manage seven oxbow lakes or, or lakes in the Amazon um, with legal training and, and also trying to um, uh, generate incentive economics to, to, to one piece family. And this is interesting because at least in the Peruvian society, there is a lot of critiques to the one piece because uh, the, the main narrative is say, is says that they don't want all uh, development projects or they don't want this type of projects, so they're going to be starving and they reject everything. But One Piece, in their exercise of self-determination, they are doing their own initiatives with their own knowledge and, 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 and their own pace, right? And so that's why it's important this initiative that it could be replicated to other One Piece communities. Next one, please. Tiracam also is helping with a One Piece breakfast, uh, as was so in the video. Also, did this you have we have in Peru this top uh, state top down state intervention, bringing food, noodles, tuna cans to rural communities. But the One Piece are pushing for for the use of the forest farm products, um, enhancing or, or 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 strengthening their local knowledge the transmission of ecological knowledge, uh, but also having healthy diets. Next one, please. And last but not least, just to be short, um, we, we always remember uh, one of the One Piece leaders that do not talk about resources in a more extractive way of thinking. He talks, he usually talks about blessings of nature, right? And the One Piece are generating management plans of non-timber forest products. Um, um, like fruit palms or rubber trees and, and, and cacao and plantain and medicinal plants and fish. Uh, and the idea is just to generate economic benefits to, 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 um, to improve uh, uh, life, but also to, to strengthen their, uh, their own exercise of doing autonomy in their own territory. Um, last but not least, uh, just I hope the, 
I mean, this very, very brief story of the One Piece case can uh, illustrate us in this international day of forest and how how what, how can we approach to nature? You know? How can we approach to forest in, in, in a different, um, um, or I mean, learning from a different context, right? Having the threats that are occurring in their territory, but also having all these range of possibilities that the One Piece interact uh, with nature and can help us to, to rebuild this kind of disruption we have, at least in, in, in part of the, our uh, current society with nature. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you, Matthias. Um, the One Piece um, story is a really inspiring story for International Day of Forests, and it shows how if you give people the rights and local decision making uh, power, you know, how they can really live in harmony with our forests. And that's what Size of Wales is trying to do across South America, Africa and Southeast Asia protect the forests that are standing, but also in areas that have experienced high levels of deforestation, uh, restore degraded forests. So for example, with the thanks of funding from the Welsh government, we're planning to plant uh, 25 million trees uh, in Uganda by 2025 and have just reached the 15 million mark. And we're also looking to work here in Wales to inspire young people, uh, businesses, companies, decision makers to take action and to protect forests as a way of tackling climate change. And last year we launched a, a new campaign to make Wales a deforestation uh, free nation. And that means to look at Wales's global deforestation footprint. But maybe just to start with, why, why are trees so important? Um, could you put up the, the second slide? Is it? Brilliant, yeah, then the next one. Great, so, I mean, it seems obvious, but obviously trees are the lungs of our planet. Um, they absorb carbon, they store it away in, in their leaves and in their soil, and they roughly store around one third of carbon dioxide released by global um, burning of fossil fuels globally. So they're really important if we want to tackle uh, the climate and nature crisis and limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. Um, next slide, please. But as Matthias has shown, um, not just in Peru, but all over the world, we are losing uh, forests at an alarming rate. And annually, um, 18 million hectares of forests are being lost. That is nine times the size of Wales, and that is one rugby pitch lost every two seconds. I think that just shows kind of the horrifying statistic and the challenges we face. And if, if deforestation were a country in terms of emissions, it would be the, the top third uh, highest emissions in the world. Um, next slide. And I think um, Matthias and the video have highlighted why um, deforestation isn't just bad news for climate change, it's also bad news for, for nature, our health, the rights of indigenous people such as the One Piece, and ultimately the well-being of future generations. So 50% of the planet land life lives in rainforests, and it's home to thousands of indigenous communities that face severe threats, often a death for standing up to, to protect the forests. And more recently, we found um, greater research about the link between deforestation and pandemics. And whilst COVID-19 wasn't caused by deforestation, other pandemics have. And this is because forests have historically been a buffer between humans and wild animals. And as the trees are being cut down, those zoonotic diseases are being uh, crossing over into humans. So really deforestation poses and not just a risk for our climate, but also a risk for our health. Uh, next slide. So what has this got to do with Wales and why do we think Wales should become a global deforestation free nation? Well, actually um, around 73% of all the deforestation in the tropics is caused by just a handful of key commodities. 
um, for example, beef from South America, soy that is used um, in animal feed to feed animals that we rear here in Wales, so particularly pork and poultry. We have palm oil, which is found in over 50% of all uh, packaged goods in supermarkets. We obviously have timber, which we saw was one of the causes of deforestation in the One Piece territory. And more recently, a growing problem of deforestation related to coffee and cacao. So these are all products that we consume in Wales on a daily basis uh, and shows that we are really part of a deforestation economy. Uh, next slide, please. So um, Wales was uh, the first nation, first parliament, sorry, to declare a climate emergency. And we were the first fair trade nation in the world. So we think Wales is well placed to be the first deforestation free nation and show global leadership in the run up to COP26. So we've, we think there are a couple of things that Wales can do to try and eliminate these commodities from its economy. And we could introduce more sustainable food and farming practices, look at our public sector procurement so that all the food uh, served, for example, in hospitals and schools isn't contributing to deforestation. Support projects such as those in the One Piece territory and also ensure that our pensions aren't funding deforestation and monitor our global deforestation footprint. And here are some pledges and changes in habits that we can introduce to, to bring about that change um, by um, buying organic meat, for example, that isn't fed on soy from, from parts of South America. Um, buying fair trade coffee and cacao um, is also a really good way to uh, reduce our deforestation footprint. So I hope that um, we have, oh, could you go to the next? Yeah, so those are some of the recommendations there that we're, we're making to the public, to policymakers, to businesses, to individuals. And I hope we've um, kind of inspired you to think today on International Day of Forest, the changes that everyone can make to ensure that our precious forests are still standing. Um, and if you'd like to find out more, um, the next slide, please. Um, please visit our website or follow us on Facebook or Twitter. And if you'd like to support also any of our projects or the One Piece projects, and um, there's opportunities to donate as well. And I just wanted to share with you um, some exciting news that in, on the 22nd of April, we are going to be uh, partnering up for the films of the forest. Um, and there will be a judging panel, including Richard Linklater and the Welsh Game of Thrones actor, Ewan Rion, um, will be um, participating in that. So if you like us on Facebook and Twitter, uh, we'll be advertising tickets there. Uh, thank you very much, Diochen Vaur. Thank you, Barbara. Um, over to David, who seems ready. Thanks very much, David. And uh, thank you to WOW for the invitation to, uh, to attend the festival and to, to speak. And uh, I hope people found it inspiring seeing the, uh, the hidden life of trees as, as I did and, and colleagues did. Um, I've got a short couple of slides to show. So if, if those could come up, that would be great. So I'm, uh, I'm one of the uh, volunteer directors with uh, Llaisi Goedig, the voice of community woodlands in Wales. So Llaisi Goedig in Welsh being the, the voice of the trees, which I think is, uh, is perhaps a bit more succinct in Welsh than, uh, than, than in English and uh, gives us a bit of a clue as to what we aim to try and do here in, in Wales. Next slide, please. 
So this is an illustration really of the multitude of, of different groups, um, different community woodland groups and some of the things that they do across Wales, whether that's actually um, being involved in, in small scale industry, um, like wood, wood timber framed houses, as you can see there, um, charcoal burning, um, wildlife walks, um, mindfulness, bushcraft, uh, shelter making. There's uh, every single community woodland in Wales is, is slightly different, but uh, I think the common thing that they have is that it's actually a way of local communities getting involved in the, the land and the woodlands around them um, to actually make sure that those have a, a community benefit in some way or another. Next slide, please. So Slice of Goethe was, was funded, was founded with just those two simple aims really. Um, as an umbrella body to, to promote and represent community woodland groups in Wales. Uh, so there are now um, 50 to 60 uh, community woodland groups, different sizes, places all across Wales. Um, but by coming together and if you like becoming one voice, we're obviously in a better position to highlight the, the value that community woodlands can, can give. And I think it's the, the bringing together of those two aspects woodland which may be owned by such as national resources wales private landowners councils etc um, and communities so that the communities have the opportunity to be a part of how those woods are used and the second aim is to provide assistance and support to local community woodland groups and initiatives so this is very much about the sharing of uh, what what one group may do, or may have found, uh, so that we feel like we live and learn together. Uh, so we will have a number of, of full members, um, just under 100, and we'll have associates, which will be individuals or organisations who will actually um, perhaps share those aims and sort of, if you like, help us and support us as, as, as kind of friends of, of community woodland groups. Okay, next slide, please. So this illustrates, this map illustrates the spread of community woodland groups all across Wales, uh, helpfully represented by a tree. And as you can see, it's kind of pretty much every part of Wales. Um, and we now have uh, part-time development officers supporting those community woodland groups in the Northwest, the Northeast, the Center, the Southeast and the Southwest. Um, so that would be new groups, uh, perhaps looking for support to get going and established groups who perhaps are looking at uh, different ideas for maybe things like income generation, undertaking surveys, wide range of things. I think you talk to 15 community woodland groups, you'll get 15 different answers. Okay, next slide please. And I think this kind of tries to sum up the fact that woodlands have multiple benefits. They, they are very important for our well-being, our connection, and I think we saw that with the earlier um, film from Peru, how important it is for the communities to be involved and um, have a connection to the, to the land and the, the areas around them. So we see that that's obviously the opportunity to, to meet the well-being goals Wales is quite groundbreaking Wellbeing being a Future Generations Act, um, highlights the need for us to consider the next generations and what we pass on to them. And woodlands are an important part of that. Secondly, the priorities of the National Forest Programme. It's obviously something that most of you in Wales certainly will have heard of, something that uh, is, uh, is part of uh, our way forward, looking to get a national forest that will be, if you like, uh, uh, a connection up of uh, important woodlands right across Wales. It's a benefit for climate change. We've heard about the importance of um, storing carbon, for example, and planting trees is a part of that. Uh, for nature, because biodiversity uh, is an important part of that well-being for all of us, um, for, for our future, and for sort of our health and well-being. So it's about connecting people with the outdoors. Next slide, please. So in summary, that's how you can get in touch with us. Um, 
And I think now we've got a short uh, film clip to illustrate a couple of the uh, community woodlands in Wales. That coming up. It's on mute. I'm Dave Williams and we're in Blindbran Community Woodland, which is on the outskirts of the town of Cumbran. It's a community wood of 100 acres with a mixture of deciduous trees, uh, mostly beech, um, but a mixture of oak and ash and uh, a lot of birch as well, plus uh, conifer from having been a former Forestry Commission plantation. As a community woodland, our aim has been to open up this area so that anyone can come up here and enjoy themselves and walking the dog, a bit of rest and recuperation, etc. We've got a number of projects we've done as a community woodland, and one has been actually developing a community orchard area where we've got 60 apple trees. We've also created a pond and we maintain the tracks for anybody to be able to come and walk through the woodland as well as a few benches, uh, keeping the perimeter fence clear, etc. So all in all, great place to be and uh, we've got about 120 members. Hi. My name's Jerry O'Keefe and I'm one of 13 directors of a community woodland project here in North Wales. Close to the villages of Marford and Gresford, the site is known as Miser Pant, which translates into the Hollow Field, which is an extremely apt name considering that the site is formerly an old quarry running to approximately 72 acres. We purchased the site in 2011 and originally planted up with caustic and pine We've engaged in an extensive programme over recent years whereby we're taking out the Corsican pine and replacing them with indigenous trees. And on that particular project we've engaged extensively with children and young people, their families and local schools. And it was one of the contributory factors to us receiving the Green Flag Award over recent years. The site is extremely popular with a good cross-section of the community. We have people of all abilities and disabilities. We've developed bike trails and the pump track and they are extremely popular with families also. In addition on site we also have a children's play area, we have an outdoor gym and we have pathways designed specifically for people of all abilities. Thank you very much indeed. My name's Melissa and I'm at Shin Park Mower, which is a community woodland on Anglesey. We manage 24 hectares of mostly Corsican pine, but also beech, alder, spruce, birch and willow. And in the past five years, we've planted thousands more native and non-native broadleaf and conifer trees. We have a large lake with a new beautiful bird hide, a wooden open-sided caban which is open to the public, used for educational events and training, and available to hire. Chimpite Mayer also has a thriving red squirrel population who are fed regularly by our volunteers. We've received funding from the National Lottery, the WCVA, the Co-op and the Community Foundation in Wales. We manage the woodland with volunteers and usually hold woodland events all year round from forest school sessions and family events to fungi forays and we have a social history project on our website. Hello, I'm Rob Platt, I'm at Glantawe Riverside Park in Pontedawe. We sat in 25 acres of beautiful grassland and woodland and have been a green flag site now for around nine years. The site was primarily alder, willow and oak, but we planted many hundreds of trees and shrubs to form new hedgerows and woodland areas, so we now have a much greater variety. Uh, such, such things as hazel, rowan, crab apple uh, in hedges, 
and broadleaf trees such as beech, copper beech, hornbeam and chestnut. We've also planted an orchard with around 10 different apple varieties. We've got uh, open grassland areas that are left to grow over the summer, uh, attracting bees and other insect life. We're open to the public 24-7 and run an outdoor education centre uh, running intervention programme for primary and secondary schools five days a week. We also have a volunteer programme every Wednesday where we provide transferable woodland skills or we will have again when the lockdown is over. Come along please and spend some time with us, we'd be very pleased to see you. That's great, hope it gives you a nice flavour, thank you. Uh, I'm Holly Cross, I'm representing Coma Ariane Renewable Energy today. Um, if you could put the slides up, that would be brilliant. Thank you. Uh, so Camarion Renewable Energy is a community benefit society. We're based in North Pembrokeshire and with our recently started project Growing Better Connections, um, we're looking to reconnect people with nature and um, restore biodiversity uh, in North East Pembrokeshire as a whole. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I'm just going to sort of take you through some of the some of the work we've been doing with Growing Better Connections um, over the last year, its first year uh, of the project. Um, it's not all about trees for us, although it has been a focus um, because, as we've all been hearing from the other projects, there there are. Um, beings that bring people together and woodlands are places that people want to spend time in uh, and very engaging. So in the brief spell we had where we could bring people together, we uh, took a group up to the Vreni Vaur, which is a piece of um, common and open access land not far from the Preseli Hills. Uh, that's this photo here. Um, and that group uh, we took part in a citizen science project which was to um, try to understand the oak woodland there so it's a it's a very unusual kind of um, woodland I mean this gives you an idea of the bigger trees but the trees go down to waist height if you could show the next slide please um, it's it's a really unusual woodland in so much also that it's it's so high up as well I think we think it's the second highest oak woodland in the UK but it's not very it doesn't seem to be very well understood um, so this is one of the ways that we're trying to engage people in their landscape. So people who'd lived around this woodland for, for many years, this for some of them was the first time that they'd actually come walking and, and sort of actually having a look at this woodland. So we're just, we, we're, this, this is an example of the volunteers picking some leaves. So we're actually trying to understand um, the, what species of oak it is and whether, for example, I mean, and if you've watched the, um, the Secret Life of Trees, whether they're all one tree or whether they're many individuals. Um, so this is something that we can really engage people in over, over the years. And we're looking to be protecting this woodland as well and helping it to expand. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, just after the trip to the Vreni Vaur woodland, we started a series of events, um, which we're still in the middle of because we've had to postpone some over the winter. Uh, but that series of events was called Local Woods for Local People. Um, and this was the first one, which is a trip to Skelton Manor, which is near Haverford West, where there's a tree nursery set up there. Uh, and the purpose of this trip was to understand how to propagate trees. So we're really trying to consider um, how we might find uh, a way to propagate trees in Wales from Welsh seed stock, um, which will help prevent uh, any of the sort of import of disease that we've, uh, yeah, we're seeing all over the world, I'm sure uh, we're all aware of. And, and then also just sort of create, uh, as, as the other speakers before me were saying, you know, an economy here where perhaps there's you know, more local provenance um, tree stock to be sold locally. If people can understand the skills of how to grow them, perhaps we'll have, a, you know, lots of, of small nurseries popping up in North Pembrokeshire. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a sec the second in the series of events. Um, this is one of our, we've got many sort of partners and friends um, with this project, Growing Better Connections. And here we are um, with the group in Coppicewood College, uh, near Kilgarran. Uh, Coppicewood College sort of showed us around their coppiced woods and, and gave a bit of a whistle stop tour to the, to the group of, of how you coppice and also what you can do with coppiced wood. So again, sort of looking at 
how you can perhaps make a living out of uh, out of managing woodlands sensitively so that you can maintain them restore them but also make um makes make an income from them uh, next slide please uh, yeah, the next few slides, the final few slides really are just, uh, this is what we've been doing um, this winter, so late winter, sort of February time, we started planting hedgerows up for several um, landowners um, in the Krimich area. Um, so our purpose of, of supporting landowners to plant more hedgerows is because hedgerows, whilst not forests, are, are a wonderful um, corridor for all sorts of bio, you know, uh, animals to, to use. It's a, it's, a, it's a highway of food as well, as well as protecting the land and, and enhancing the land. So even for grazing, um, having a really good hedgerow, is, it's, a, it's much better for, for the actual quality of the grass. Um, so this is, we, you can see the lovely view beyond us. We've been very privileged to have some sunny days to plant um, thousands and thousands of trees. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is Paul and Dorothy. Uh, I just, <laughs> I love the joy of this photograph. And they, they were so delighted to have us. I mean, and they're just examples of several landowners that have just been so delighted to have us come along and, and help them out with, with tree planting or hedgerow planting. And, and I suppose our project is fitting in in a different way to the, for example, Welsh Government Agri-Environment Schemes, in that we're, we really try to create a relationship with these, um, these landowners and, and a dialogue with them to get them what they want, but also to help biodiversity and bring people um, on board and get them involved in, in the actual planting itself. Uh, last slide, please. I think we've got two more actually. Yeah, so this is just well, during yeah the, the the slide before was uh, was an example of um, we're using um, best practice where we can. So we're not just whacking trees in the ground. A, we're buying British trees, British grown trees. We're also um, we're um, I don't want to use the word infect inoculate. That's the word <laughs> inoculating them with a mycorrhizae, which is a, a mix a fungi mixture, which uh, as we understand it will will help the trees grow stronger and will also help them to communicate with one another. Uh, so it, it's um, yeah we're just trying to show people best practice of of what trees to use and how to plant them, and the the mycorrhizae, which is actually again a local product. There's a there's a Pembrokeshire based. A company making this mycorrhizae um, to yeah so that we're supporting local businesses as well so the last slide please yeah again another example of us uh, planting up so uh, this is a great example we've got a beautiful mature hawthorn tree here but it's it, it's it's a very intensively farmed um, farm. Um, but what this hedgerow is going to do is connect some common land to um, some riparian woodland, so woodland that goes along the river. And it really genuinely will. Um, we were sitting and joking whilst we were having our lunch, we might see an otter trotting up one day, but genuinely it will become a corridor, a safe haven and a food corridor for, for animals. Um, yeah, thank you very much. That's the last slide. Um, I, I will share as well a link to a film that we've created, um, which actually includes speakers from Slicer Coidwig and a couple of people from community woodlands across Wales. Um, so we're we're not an intermediary, but we're almost um, supporting community groups who have an interest in in setting up maybe enterprises and woodlands, and we can sort of point them towards Slicer Coidwig and we can point them towards all of the support organisations and just really create a, a, a dialogue and an inspiration in our very local area. Um, and I think, uh, you know, that that's something that I was thinking when Matthias was saying about the mapping and the knowing, you know, we're working with essentially with indigenous people in our local area who, who can get, you know, who can share their knowledge of this landscape that they've lived with all their lives and for many generations. And yes, they're not seeing the kind of de deforestation that you might be seeing in the Amazon, but there is a denusing of the landscape here with agriculture, the way it's been in the last sort of 70 plus years. So we can support the people that live here and have farmed here, you know, all their lives to, to try and adjust to the way we think we need to see farming happen and we need to see people's relationships improving with nature then then um, we'll be we'll be really happy and hopefully they will be too <laughs> uh, so thanks very much thank you thank you holly um and 
Prinhounda, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Rowan Alain. I um, also work, like David, who you will have met on this Zoom call already, for WOW Film Festival. And it was supposed to be my job to chair this event today. Unfortunately, my internet connection went down at one minute to four, just as we were about to admit everybody from the waiting room. So apologies if it has been at all um, disjointed uh, in any of the links. Um, and um, apologies to the speakers. It was the last thing. It was my worst nightmare that that was going to happen at precisely that uh, moment. But um, I was I did manage to make it back in time for the presentations. And um, it was really my hope um, that um, by creating this event today, um, that it would um, create some space for um, sharing um, different people's experiences of connecting people with um, woodlands um, and also to um, provoke people really to reflect on um, our interconnections globally between us here in Wales um, and the rest of the world and see where the parallels are and I can already see in each of your responses to each other's um, presentations um, that you're already you know beginning to pick up on on those commonalities and things that you can learn from each other. Um, so I would like, before I open um, uh, it out to the floor, to the audience for questions for the panel, I'd like to first kind of ask the panel whether about, whether you, any of you have questions for each other. Um, and uh, if one of you wants to dive in, uh, maybe raise your hands and, and Reese will um, unmute you and um, we can proceed in that way. Um, Holly. I'd be interested to hear more um, from the Size of Wales project, because I mean, I'm finding that such an inspiring concept and it's clearly generated loads of interest and loads of networks. But selfishly, uh, as a Welsh based project, I'd be really interested to know a bit more about um, the kind of education and work that you're doing in Wales as well. Shall I, shall I answer now, Rowan? Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, so Size of Wales, we were set up over 10 years ago um, with the aim of, you know, protecting tropical forests the size of Wales, but we really felt that it was really important to engage with people living in Wales to address the kind of climate crisis. And we have been working with a lot of schools across Wales, running um, workshops in primary and secondary schools, um, around climate change, around how to protect forests. So you've got kind of forest detective games, etc. And we run a really exciting program called the Mock Cop, which is young people coming together, representing different nations as if it as if it were a cop, a kind of climate change conference, and they have to come to an agreement. And it's amazing seeing uh, secondary school students really inspired, really taking this issue seriously and coming up with some really quite good kind of recommendations and kind of um, decisions. And we also support um, a youth climate um, ambassador network of some inspiring young people um, from across Wales who have met with the US embassy. They were speaking at the UN. Um, one of them just took over the, the kind of future gen, gens uh, social media page a few days ago. Uh, so they're really getting their message out and showing how you know, amazing future leaders they will be. And last year we started with our kind of policy campaign about our deforestation free uh, kind of supply chain, because we realized that whilst it's really important to support projects such as with the One Piece, and other um, projects overseas, if we don't actually address the fundamental causes and the structural issues that are contributing to deforestation, it's, it's like just putting a plaster over a big, big wound. You know, we really need to be addressing the, why are these forests being cut down overseas and how can we look at our own behavior and practices? So we've been speaking to Welsh governments, we've been speaking to businesses, to farmers, um, about how we can change um, our, particularly our eating habits and our farming habits to reduce the importation of those forest commodities. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> Matthias. Uh, I have a question for, for Holly and David. 
um, I mean, I'm, I'm a bit of uh, far from the Wales context, but I wonder um, if there is any pressure or what kind of pressure those woodlands have or receive in, in where, where, where you are, where you are, and uh, any illegal, illegal activity, or I think Holly mentioned farming. Um, I don't know, maybe building construction for, 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 for urban places. And, and if that happened, what kind of the strategies these woodland communities um, carry out to defend uh, the, their spaces? Thank you. David, go ahead. I'm sure you have okay. some <laughs> We don't have the, quite the same problem, perhaps, of, of the deforestation that, that was articulated so well in, in, in your film. But what we do have, I think, is, is spoilation of the forest in terms of vandalism uh, and destruction um, by, by, by people um, lighting fires, for example. In the woodland where I am, there were fires every, every year. People would burn part of the woodland. So that has been one of the things that we've, we've tried very much to inform and educate people, particularly young people. The, th the, the most important thing as I see it is if you get young people involved coming into the woodland, planting trees, doing some activities, then they will feel a part of it and they're less likely to destroy it. And so that's been a really important thing that, that we have found to do in, in the, the community woodland that I'm involved in, as an example. Over to Holly. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd agree with that. I don't think the woodland are under even a small amount of the kind of pressure that the Amazon and those you know native forests are however they are under pressure from from farming practices and I suppose I mean just the example of the Vreni Vauer woodland you know I think uh, the one with the oaks that, that you saw at the beginning of my slides people do respect it and they do enjoy it but the the, the few graziers that use the, that common are you know it's like it's kind of annoying to have a tiny little forest there to get your sheep lost in and there's a, it's really really important that we we our, that's what I see our project is doing is that we do keep that kind of conversation going so that you can find a middle ground between the needs of farmers who essentially are feeding the country <laughs> you know they, they come under so much criticism but they are feeding the country in the only way they know how but finding that middle ground between what they need and then what what nature needs and also what the community needs so I think brokering that dialogue is something that we find really important and with the example of the Vreni Vaur there are mechanisms in Britain where we can protect uh, areas of land and forestry can be protected. It, I think it's uh, quite a, a strenuous bureaucratic process, <laughs> but it's the one that's really worth going through because that, that forest can then be protected in the long term for many, many future generations. Thank you, Holly. Um, I'd now like to start um, opening um, the conversation out to the floor. Um, so if you have a question for the panellists or a point you wish to raise, please raise your hands either like this on camera um, or you can use the reactions button. Um, if you uh, would like to, please um, start your video and unmute so you can ask the question in person. If you prefer not to appear on camera, um, you may also pop your question in the chat and we'll be moderating that. Um, I believe we do have a question from Linda Norris in Pembrokeshire. Linda, would you like to go? Yeah, I was just going to ask if any of the panelists, if you're if you're working with artists on any of these projects. Thank you. I could see Barbara nodding too, but um, we're just on the cusp, we hope, and Rowan will know this too, of, of beginning a, a, a relationship between our organisation and, and a, um, an organisation called Maynard. And I mean, Rowan will probably explain better what Maynard do, but um, creative dance, living, living and being in the landscape and engaging with people through creative output um, instead of maybe the sort of more scientific output that our organisation um, puts out. So we, we've been trying for a long while to find a way of doing more work through a creative outlook because we know that engages uh, hearts and minds as, as well as hands. I mean, our relationship with WOW Film Festival over, the sev over several years has been such an inspiring way of getting people through the door. And 
almost a roundabout way of having a conversation about something that people may not think they're interested in yeah. i.e nature but actually they probably are because they've got a relationship with the land so yeah it's it's a good question and it's it's something that we're trying more and more to do thanks holly barbara did you want to come in on that yeah, we've since about a year ago, we've been trying to kind of link up arts, culture and the work that we're doing. That's, you know, thanks to my colleague Anna, how we've become involved with uh, the WOW Festival as well. And we actually had submitted a, a concept about working with the Indigenous people of, of the One Piece. They have a traditional um, kind of music and, and song that they use. Um, and we'd hoped that we would get funding from the British Council to, to work with young people in Peru, but also young people here through kind of rap music, indigenous local music and, and dance to take something to COP. Unfortunately, we didn't get funding for it, but we're hoping to, to try and find something similar because it was such a brilliant way of getting voices from young people from the Amazon, from Wales, uh, and send them to leaders in the COP. So we, we think that art and culture is really important. We're trying to develop um, that work uh, this year and in coming years as well. Thank you, Barbara. Um, I can see that uh, Daniel Blackburn has his hand raised. Um, so Reese, if you could spotlight Dan, and Dan, if you can unmute. Hi there. Um, I was really inspired um, to hear about the Size of Wales project um, and, you know, that linkaging between Wales and, and um, projects like Matthias's. Um, something that's very close to my heart because I, I worked as a forester um, for nearly five years in the Philippines um, and was involved in, um, you know, forest protection with local people there and, and, and you know, learnt firsthand how much pressure those forests are under and how difficult it is and and what a, a kind of lonely job it is for the communities trying to defend the forest and and um you know um it's so so dangerous um so you know we we were involved in a paralegal activity that people are actually being arrested for for defending the forest and so i worked to get a number of people out of prison for actually you know taking chainsaws from illegal loggers that was seen as stealing whereas you know the stealing of the trees wasn't um so i was just interested um you know it's great that, that we've got this link through this event but what what direct linkages does the size of wales project enable um so you know is there any film recording to get the stories of, of the wumpies um out there you know we've, we've had the film clip um, but is there any chance to to personally link? And you know what, what we found in the in the, in the Philippines were that um, non timber forest pro products that which were highlighted in that piece are really important for protecting the forest. You want to have products that don't involve cutting down the trees, and actually you know put a value on the trees. And I just wondered if the size of Wales project was actually um, trying to market doing a direct link and using that as a link to sort of like say, hey, you know, the, these are the great products um, by, um, you know, by purchasing these products, um, you're, you're, you're giving livelihoods which protect the forest because that's something we were always trying to do and it was very difficult, um, you know, to get foreign markets, to get better markets for non-timber forest products. And, and the other thing is, I don't know of your relationship, um, Barbara, with, with the Welsh government. Can Welsh government actually come in? And, you know, I think that would be a strong signal if, um, you know, you know, say the Peruvian government or their local government aren't behaving as they might do. It certainly happened in the Philippines, whether you have that sense of advocacy by saying, oh, we're a nation pointing out bad practice um, and, 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 and acting in solidarity with indigenous people. I don't know whether your project does that also. So sorry, that's a lot of points. So um, yeah, very inspiring. Thank you. Matthias, do you want to mention what, what we're doing in the project with the looking at the different livelihoods opportunities? And the, yeah, okay. Yeah. And I'll answer the second question maybe. 
Well, well, that, the thing. Uh, thank you, Daniel, for the that question and and your experience as a forester. I'm a forester as well. So, um, the 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 idea of, with the one piece is that um, first they are they, they know their territory and they are trying to um, uh, identify these blessings of nature, as I, as I mentioned, that they they consider. Um, um, and what I mean to, to look at those stocks, uh, stocks of, of, of trees or palms of, of medicinal plants, located them, but also identifying their own capacities in terms of communities or um, social capacities, strengths, and weakness to 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 come up with management plans for each type of these blessings of nature and 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 try to seek for for any market that could be helpful to increase uh, um, their 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 economic uh, economic in their families but uh doing in um in a sustainable way like you mentioned for example there were some palm trees obviously it's not cutting that cutting cutting down the trees but climbing the palm and then extract uh, getting the fruit um but that's that's the idea of Identifying a, a, a range of options uh, that offers the forest or the farm forest interface, and 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 try to see if they can, um, under their own terms, in this uh, um, overarching process of construction or building autonomy and self determination in their own territory, engage with these uh, activities or economic activities and, and and blessings of nature. I hope that can illustrate a little bit. Thank you, Matthias. And um, Barbara, did you want to come in on the second question? Yes. So um, last year, there was a particularly difficult situation in the One Piece territory with the COVID pandemic. And the proving government had ordered a, a national lockdown, as, as we had here. But um, operators of one of the oil companies, Geopark, were still entering into the One Piece territory, putting at risk the entire community because this could have been a way that the disease could have spread. And the One Piece did a lot of advocacy work in Peru um, about the issue. And we decided to raise um, their concerns with the British embassy in, in Peru, in Lima, writing a letter of concern and also letting other um, organizations in the UK know and FPP um, did an article in, in, a, in a newspaper in Scotland about, about the situation. So we really tried to raise awareness about this one particular threat that was facing the community at the time of the COVID pandemic. Um, up until now, we haven't um, engaged much with the Welsh government because what, Wales has a kind of connection with Africa through the Wales and Africa program. So at the moment doesn't have any funding um, specifically for South America. But you know, that, that doesn't mean to say that they couldn't kind of, you know, as part of their responsibility of being a globally responsible nation, um, you know, support that. But I think there's definitely um, occasions where size of Wales with FPP can support the community because they are the ones at the forefront of kind of um, defending their territory raise awareness particularly in cases where um, companies often international companies with British investments are operating and are putting at risk the community as was the case in with Geopark so yeah it's really important that that we support them because they are being threatened you know they get death threats you know, they are they are, you know occasionally having to uh, kick off illegal miners from their territory it's very very dangerous and um you know having that backing international backing is really crucial thank you um so there's a couple of questions in the chat um one's from emma in fact there's two questions from emma which i'll read out um, is Size of Wales doing any work on how Wales could move away from re reliance on imported timber and soy, i.e. increasing resilient productive timber in Wales and encouraging pasture-fed livestock over grain-fed? And then the second question is, so is it better to create new woodlands or protect ancient forests for carbon sequestration? 
for biodiversity, well-being and human rights, I think it's obvious protecting existing trees is vital. So would any of the panelists like to respond? Uh, perhaps if um, Size of Wales and Matthias respond to um, the first question. Yes, yeah, so definitely we're looking at um, farming practices as Wales is leaving or has left, well, the UK has left the EU, we now have an opportunity to um, put together a new agricultural bill which is currently being uh, discussed and we are calling for a move away from soy feed um, that is coming from places such as South America and moving to kind of more grass fed um, non and kind of soy alternatives you, you can get organ organic soy which tends to come from Europe which hasn't contributed to deforestation so we believe that there is an opportunity to support farmers in Wales to bring about new um, farming methods that are more um, sustainable for forests overseas and also here because you know, farmers you know farmers aren't doing this on purpose but they're not given the financial support or the, the backing really to kind of look for alternatives. And we need more research into alternative um, feeds for animals. Um, what was the other question? Sorry. <laughs> Is it better to create new woodlands or protect ancient forests for carbon sequestration? Well, I think there was a recent uh, report uh, launched by Kew Gardens and they were kind of the 10 golden rules of tree planting. And the first golden rule was best to protect standing forests. And then, you know, if we are going to plant trees, it's the right trees in the right place. You know, what Holly was saying about planting indigenous trees uh, with communities, that it benefits nature and people um, is the way forward. But we have trees there that an amazing source of carbon storage let's protect those and plant trees we can do both but you know definitely protecting the trees that we have is is really important thank you uh would any of the other panelists like to come in on that one before we move on just just, just from the last sec last, last question i think it's mm. important like barbara was saying protecting the, the the ancient forest and and also be careful with what we are seeing, at least in the Amazon or some tropical areas, that these kind of green um, sort of uh, mechanisms or green laundry, like we are saying, to we 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 deforest primary forests to do reforestation of, of new trees, which doesn't make sense, and actually also uh, galvanize these the land grabbing, big land grabbings uh, by international companies in indigenous areas. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, so um, there are some more questions in the chat. I can see someone, uh, Sue actually, with a hand raised. So perhaps if we'll come to Sue first. Okay, is that me? Uh, it looks like you, but your, your screen name says Sue. Yeah, so it's our, it's that's my wife Sue. Misnamed. <laughs> Jeremy Bugler and Sue Bugler. Um, together, we run um, something called the Size of Herefordshire, which is a sort of small version of um, the Size of Wales. And we, we're on the border of Wales, of course, and we started about five years ago and have benefited greatly from the example and the support of the Size of Wales. Um, and we, too, um, run a project like the Size of Wales, supporting the One Piece people and um, by various fundraising, we've managed to um, raise, um, I'm glad to say, many thousands for the, um, for the Forest People's Programme to use to, to help with the One Piece people. And uh, my question is, is really for Mateus, really. I wondered if um, you could g give us an, um, me an indication um, whether there is in Peru any, any change in the public mood about the value of rainforests. Um, in, in Peru, is the, are the rainforests that you have, these amazing rainforests, valued even more now, or um, is there no change, or whatever? I'd be grateful, Mateus. Thank you, Sue. Um, thank you. It, it, it's, it's changing. I think I, I wouldn't say it is not. I mean, people are more conscious about the importance of standing trees and, and, and forests. 
um, the national government is taking uh, climate commitments, for example, to reducing emissions of 40% to 2030. So that's, there are some of the, the, um, the advances. Um, however, um, right now with the COVID-19 crisis also, we have seen uh, uh, the loss of, 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 of how do you say, jobs of, of thousands of people. And, um, and we are seeing a big push of, uh, like I mentioned before, uh, to reactivate the economy at the expense of forests or indigenous territories, right? I mean, uh, we still have this colonial, colonial man's mindset. From Lima, we see the, the rainforest as a vast area to, to feed or to produce and, and, and to be exploited, right? So uh, there is more consciousness among young people, I would say, um, in cities, yes, um, but there is still a lot of job to do and, and also to be careful with these legal mechanisms that open the Amazon for for the, the, how do you say, the, the, the business as usual exploitation of forest. I hope that responds. Thank you, Matthias. Um, there are a few other questions in the chat. Uh, I think one of which was from Gwenda, Mark. Gwenda, are you happy to come on camera and ask a question? Yeah, really inspirational stuff going on in Peru. Um, and I mean, we, yes, we suffer from a lot of uh, tree loss just because the councils, um, you know, sadly, I suppose, you know, we've, we've lost all the old skills to do with how to really look after our hedgerows and ha using handmade tools. And, you know, we've, we've now become fully mechanized. And of course, once you've invested in big bits of um, uh, wood cutting tools, then you, you end up using them um, a lot. And so all our hedgerows have been decimated. And I'd really love this to turn around because I see the hedgerows as biodiversity corridors. And more and more I hear of this tree planting going on and thousands of trees being planted, but they're just gonna go into hedgerows that are gonna get all chopped down. And because of the way we're doing it, we're, we're just um, you know, cutting the hazel, the uh, fruit trees all at the wrong time. And we end up with just sycamore in our hedgerows and nothing else. And until we tackle that, all the rest is, is, a, bit, is a bit silly. You know, we have to protect what we already have. Anyway, that's, so I'm just interested to know whether there is anything going on in Wales um, that is sort of protecting these, these trees that are not in private ownership, not in, you know, and, and sort of, I suppose, public ownership. Hmm. In fact, I don't own these places on the highways. Anyway. I think Holly's going to come in on that one. Yeah, Gwendo, I mean, I, I feel the same. And I, I mean, our project has been um, exploring ways that we could perhaps, even if it's just in a local way, support the local authority to change the routine of cutting hedgerows in such a seemingly um, brutal way. Um, and there, I've been really encouraged uh, by all the, there's lots of talk at sort of local authority and um, Welsh government level about looking at this as it seems to be a recurring issue of discussion. So at the local and national level, there's a local nature partnership, which um, uh, in Pembrokeshire is headed up by Ant Rogers, who is the Pembrokeshire um, Biodiversity Officer. And that whole, that's a Wales wide project. And one of the things that they're really looking at is working with local authorities to change hedge cutting routines. Um, there are also a couple of Wales wide initiatives supported by the national, uh, the Welsh government. Um, I'm just trying to remember there's there's a there's a project called the Green Recovery Green. I think it's all nature recovery, which is trying to bring all the interested parties in nature recovery together across Wales um, and they've invited um, organizations like ours to to make proposals about what could be a really transformative changes 
our organization actually proposed hedgerow management as potentially really transformative change and we in, at a sort of north pembrokeshire scale are looking at finding funding and more support to to show local authority and then also landowners that there are other ways of managing hedgerow for a product um for you know whether that be fruit or whether that be wood or whether that be wood chip whether that be charcoal um so i think there are things going on um i was watching the um Secret Life of Trees last night. One of the things that really struck me was that um, I can't remember his name. The author was saying, "Nature is slow," <laughs> and I know we all feel really urgent. <laughs> we need things to move now, but sometimes I have to just take a breath and go. Local authority is also slow, <laughs> but there are encouraging things happening. I feel. Thanks, Holly. I think um, David had his hand raised then. David, do you want to come in? Yeah, th th thanks very much, uh, Rowan. I think one of the important things is, is, and certainly it's one of the things we find with a lot of the community woodland groups, is that they're very keen to, and many of them do run courses in terms of sort of traditional management uh, techniques. I think Holly mentioned Coppicewood College, for example, over in, in the southwest of Wales. So there, there are there are people going back to learning some of these skills and very much looking to um, promote them. Um, I've been on sort of um, such as uh, dry stone walling, for example, and hedge laying um, courses and things like that. So, so it's one of the things I would suggest to, to look out for. And the second thing is, yes, it's actually by connecting together and making the point um, that we've we've highlighted as 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 much as uh, as uh, as with other groups that it's important to preserve our urban trees as well as the planting of new woodlands, because that is that is for many people, their experience of trees and woodland is in their parks, their roadsides, et cetera. And we need to protect those in the hedgerows, as you've rightly said. I think that's a, a really, really valid point. Um, in fact, um, not far from where I live, um, in St. Dogmalls, um, you know, there's a strong heritage of uh, apple trees and there's been a lot of community level work um, to renew those apple trees which are now aging because fruit trees don't have such a long um, lifespan. And so actually within this large village of St Dogmalls, it's almost town sized really, um, there's an awful lot that can be done for biodiversity within individual homes and gardens. Um, I want to check in with the panelists because it's now um, 25 past five almost. So we've been going nearly an hour and a half. Does anybody want to uh, leave or do how do we have time for one or two more questions? Um, yeah, you're all fine. Um, it's, there's such an amazing, I don't think we're gonna get through everything that's in the chat this afternoon. Um, if anybody has a burning question that they would like to come on camera and ask, um, please do raise your hand. Um, otherwise, I've got a, I've got a final question that I'd really like to ask. Uh, Cara, so um, I would love to uh, hear uh, what people, you know, panel or not on the panel, but I'd love to hear what do you think about, you know, this issue of slow nature. Should, you know, in an ideal world, would you rather? Uh, if we're trying to reforest our country, particularly in the UK, we're, we're quite denuded of trees compared to Peru. Um, would you favour natural regeneration or would you favour tree nurseries and tree planting, big projects with plastic tree guards everywhere? You know, what what do you think is better? And, uh, you know, what does Mateus think? What does Barbara think? Yeah, what do you think in, in the UK and further afield? I'd love to hear what you think. So, David, fact, you I mean, very, very quickly, I think one of the things is that if you've got the right tree in the right place, it grows better. Mm. Um, and that's certainly one of the things that, that I've seen, and, and Mateus may say something for Peru, has been that once we've been able to, to protect the woodland from the grazing from sheep, etc., then you'll get things growing quite quickly, and it'll be the, the, that dormant native woodland and flora that starts to regenerate. So there's a place for that, but there are also places that haven't been woodland in the past that do need the input. And uh, I loved what Holly was saying about sort of actually sort of impregnating the trees to sort of be, be planted. 
and that was a really good way of actually sort of spreading that sort of free culture, as it were, into new places. Thanks, David. <clears throat> Uh, anybody else want to respond to Cara's question? Just, just uh, like David mentioned, the trees know how, where to grow. I mean, that's the response in from Amazon and farmers, and and they really allow their natural regeneration to do the the job, right? Which sometimes it's how do you say it, overshadowed by that that per se tree by tree plantation of the trees, and and you can save a lot of money and 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 time and and an effort because just seeing what the farmers do and 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 letting the tree seedlings, I mean the, the mother trees, in their own spaces and they can do the job. But I'm not very well familiar with the wells environment, but that's what can happen in the Amazon. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gwen, uh, did you want to come in on? You well, memories. really, it's just listening to the secret life of trees and Peter Baum, well, I can't think of his name, the person who, who did the film. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, he was saying that there were these sort of parent trees and that sort of connection that you have between trees is really important. And so... Um, you know, I think we've got to think a lot more about, you know, how trees actually are communities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we don't really allow that to happen. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you think, oh, I think I'll go out to the nursery and I'll get 20 beech trees and um, plant those there and, you know, 10 oaks. And you put these dry rooted stocks in and you think, oh, well, they're young and they're all sort of. And in a way, you know, what he was saying was that these trees have got to really be a lot more mixed up. You know, you've got to have um, lots of different types of trees and communities forming. And, you know, in many ways, we don't have that knowledge to understand. I'm sure in Peru, actually, there's a lot of um, indigenous, not indigenous knowledge of, you know, how, um, you know, what type of trees do grow well with each other. And, you know, we have so little understanding of how things really should be growing. I mean, all I've noticed is that, you know, wherever I've found a, a huge bramble patch, there's always some tree in the middle. And it's, mm. you know, and before you know it, it's, it's actually a sapling. So I've often wondered maybe the best thing is not to plant the tree, but to, bra to actually put in a load of bramble. And then something else, you know, and then the soil's prepared for whatever it is that will come. <laughs> anyway, <Thanks. sorry. laughs> uh, I can see a couple of hands raised. Um, Bill, or if, if Bill goes first. Unmuted. Um, no, I was just thinking of, of the, the, you know, the balance between um, sort of mass tree planting and allowing things to naturally regenerate and spread. Um, and obviously there is just the time involved in doing that and the pressures behind that. But there's also something like when you see HS2, I don't know if Matthias would understand, this is a massive sort of infrastructure problem in England where they're putting a big tr uh, train line through, um, cutting down natural forest but then uh, sort of mitigating that by planting trees. So I, I would suggest that there would be on big infrastructure projects like that, where they, they, they make an, you usually make about an impact assessment of what your building is going to do, but you should also be able to make an, uh, be asked to make an impact assessment of the variety of trees. What is the impact in 50 years time? of just planting this tree or, or, you know, and so it would encourage people in that uh, process to, to uh, think really clearly about a mixed forest at the end of it, rather than just bunging in a swathe of something. It's a sort of a, a systemic way of trying to get people to think about it by enshrining it in a sort of uh, uh, process. 
Yeah, I, I think I've, I've heard recently um, through my other work in the National Park Authority, um, where I work when I'm not working on this film festival, um, of examples elsewhere where in decision making um, processes, and I think Cornwall Council is a good example, for example, um, where in they're really taking into account all these things, kind of using a, a donor economics model. So um, every decision made, they're taking into account, you know, the various different impacts that could be made. And I think that's something that we need to encourage all decision makers um, to do. So, you know, it's a way of sort of um, balancing out um, the issues that are going to be caused by, uh, you know, particular decisions or strategies, policies, that kind of thing. Um, it's so we know what sort yeah. of woodland we will end up with, I think. Yeah. But that's a yeah. really good my point really. Um, Cara had her hand raised uh, briefly before Cara, do you oh, still want to? Sorry, yeah, I was just gonna, I was just typing it. I was just thinking actually when, if we allow, sadly, you know, we haven't uh, got pristine natural forests. So when we do allow natural regeneration next to woodland, we quite often get, you know, like Peter was saying on the film, we get a regeneration of the plantation species, you know, the spruce or whatever that should actually be, that is more of an upland tree and shouldn't be lower down. So you often see that in some of our community woodlands, they've got quite an issue with the plantation commercial species regenerating and they're desperately trying to get rid of them. So they offer free Christmas tree um, cutting down for and local communities like in Swansea so that to get the community to help take away those plantation trees that shouldn't really be there um so that's a bit of an issue with natural regeneration in, in some areas thanks Cara um I think Bob Coitilas has had his hand raised for quite a while and we haven't managed to come around yet um, Bob? Oh, yeah, it was it was um, partly about um, what Cara was saying. So I, in my planting of trees, I did it through Glastier Woodland Creation, and you had to have a planner, um, mostly for the paperwork. They didn't really understand what I wanted. They knew about plantation forests and how to do those very well, um, but uh, yeah, and then I didn't want to spray them, you know either so I I was told I had to put plastic mulch mats down which was not a good idea um I had to have plastic spiral wraps which certainly for any of the the trees that that kick off uh, the beginning trees um whatever the word is um they don't need anything you know a, a, yeah that's the one pioneers they they don't need anything they will get on with their job they will kick the grass out the way. They will be eaten by rabbits and they will pop back up again. It's they don't need anything. And I the way the government see trees is they only see tree. They don't see species. They don't see. And I think if we're going to do it, we need to do it via knowing and understanding our trees um, and taking each oh, individual tree as their specific you know with their own needs their own way of living um you know if you leave a hazel after 50 years or you know, i think it might be 75 as its maximum it'll die if we don't coppice it um but if we cut it halfway up with a hedge flail it, it really doesn't help it either it would probably die in 10 years so i think you know and, and now you know listening to the we're well, watching the the secret life of trees i wonder what glyphosate is doing to the trees because they get sprayed um three times a year for three to five years that's th that's the management trees get so who knows what we're doing there with all the mycelium trying to survive that um whether whether our trees have been have had their voice box cut off and and they can't talk to each other and they can't help each other out so yeah, I think both is needed, but when it comes to us planting them, we really need to think about the trees rather than our needs. It's the trees' needs and the very specific variety of trees as well. That's, yeah, that's what I thought I'd say. Thanks for that, Bob. Um, 
Do any of the panelists want to come in and respond to that? Um, I was wondering, before we wrap up, there's been a question in the chat um, from somebody saying it'd be really useful to um, set up a forum uh, in response to this event. Um, so if you are interested in maybe keeping in touch with other people on this Zoom call, um, perhaps just pop your email uh, if you don't want to put it completely publicly, maybe just to me um, uh, in the chat before the end of the call, and then I can find a way of, uh, you know, maybe setting up an email list or something so that people can share resources, um, share skills, signpost people, you know, to other places. And I could also um, then mail out the records uh, of what's gone in the chat um, today as well. Um, Great. OK, I can see lots of email addresses coming in. Uh, and Hannah, uh, Cara's got her hand up. Do you want I'll just, to just to say if it's of any help. I mean, Kleiser Goidwig, uh, it's the network for community woodlands, but we also do. We have a lot of members who don't have community woodlands who are just supporters and interested. So it is a place where you can join the network and carry on this conversation. We have 90 odd woodlands but we have nearly 500 members and we're there we share information we share news we have events um we've got facebook page and a newsletter so feel free to join that as well if that's useful to keep the conversation going thanks car i think that's probably a really good um place to place to go if you're looking for further information and i would also you know recommend following size of wales um, and keeping in touch particularly if you're near north pembrokeshire like me with holly um, as well um, are there any other burning questions from anybody else here in the room otherwise i've got one final question i'd like to ask uh, before we end the call today Don't see any hands raised anywhere um, I, uh, my question really was kind of on reflection, on listening um, to all the speakers today, uh, that like, at the heart of what we need to do is um, involve local people in decision making, um, involve them in the conversation of, around conservation and protecting woodlands. Um, this seems to be something that we have in common in Wales with anywhere else in the world. Um, what are the practical steps? What are the tools? Um, what do we need to do um, to make sure that we are involving um, local people in these conversations and in these decisions? Holly. I mean, I think one of the things that um, Linda's question earlier sort of started was, you know, when she asked about whether artists are being involved in, in these kinds of pieces of work is just have the conversation from many different perspectives and bring in as many different sorts of people as you possibly can and be out there <laughs> in as many different places as you can. So take it from a generational perspective or a language perspective. I think that's the, that's the starting point for us is you just try and we're trying to put on as many sorts of events and activities which appeal across the board. So like I said, those who didn't think they were interested actually find that they are because they've come because they want to watch a film or they want to actually learn how to uh, identify an oak. So yeah, that would be my one of many potential ways of answering that question. <laughs> Thanks Holly. Uh, David. Yeah, following on from what Holly said, uh, it's it's about talking to the people who 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 there, who who walk in the woods, who 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 uh, are interested, who who live close by, and for us, it was very much a case of of having lots of conversations, and um, what's important to people, and for some people, one of the little things that we've done in the community woodland where I am, is that we've had a a kind of drop in tea in the trees. For anybody who's walking up in the woodland to come and ask any questions or uh, ask us about anything or tell us about anything um, and yeah get people talking. Nice, trees and cake. Um, and Matthias have you got any tips for us in Wales from your work with the One Piece? Um, well according to what's happening in Peru where you have this clash from the top-down intervention that wants to 
insert a natural protected area, but you have on the other side, indigenous people that have been managed this mountain range for hundreds of years and they have all classified and zone, do the zoning of that area and saying that this is untangible. I think that what, what it has been said already create or generate these social spaces and political spaces as well to, to, to dialogue and to listen, maybe also to, to avoid this, how do you say it, um, um, uh, uh, this um, perspective that sometimes uh, natural scientists or biologists or environmental at least uh, have vis-a-vis -vis the indigenous uh, people that that maybe they cannot offer so much to the conservation uh, world. I think that it's time to balance and, and, and equal and have a, a, a proper dialogue and recognize, support and strengthen what it's already there. Thank you. Very wise words. Thank you. And Barbara, do you want to come in? Yeah, just to echo what everyone else has said, but also I think decision making also means having control over the funding that's allocated for these this work. And, you know, with COP coming up, sorry, my children in the background, and with COP coming up, you're going to see a lot more finance uh, growing finance being targeted towards forest protection. If this isn't put into the hands of the local and indigenous people, then you know that just having consultations isn't enough. So it's about decision-making, but also kind of the resources given to the, to the local communities. The One Piece, for example, we supported them to have a boat to, to travel around their huge territory, to have, you know, phones to monitor the deforestation rates. So you, know, you need to have funding and protection for those people, particularly those really working on the front line. Thank you, Barbara. Um, I have actually one more final, final question. Um, sorry to leap in. I'm, I'm sure there are lots more questions here, which is around this question of Wales becoming the first deforestation free nation. What can we all do today um, to, you know, push the Welsh government to make this happen? I think, you know, write about it, um, ask your local politician, you know, what action are they taking on protecting forests, both here in Wales and overseas? Speak to companies, everyone works, you know, maybe works in a company. What are you doing in your local, you know, maybe canteen at, at the office when we maybe go back to the office or in your child's school or in hospitals? You know, everyone can make a difference, speak to supermarkets. You know, at the end of the day, we actually think though it isn't up to the consumers to have to make those difficult choices when we go into a supermarket. We should expect that everything on those shelves isn't contributing to deforestation. Just take palm oil, for example, it has over 200 derivatives. It's extremely difficult to know whether you're buying something that might be contributing to deforestation. So we, we really hope that governments bring in mandatory legislation that companies should be checking their supply chain, making sure that as we are doing here on, on slavery, that they are checking that products that they bring into Wales isn't contributing to deforestation, to set a level playing field. And the Welsh public want that, even companies want that, because at the moment you're just seeing some companies taking action. And if not everyone takes action, then it doesn't create a level playing field. So those are some of the things we can all make individual steps, um, but also we need a, a global effort to tackle this problem. Thank you very much, Barbara. And um, thank you to all our panelists today. Uh, Barbara from Size of Wales, Matthias from the Forest Peoples Programme in Peru, David Williams from Kleiser Goidwig and Holly Cross from Growing Better Connections, um, Kumarian in North Pembrokeshire, my Wedi Board and Pleser, Dudu Moinhai, Drosben. Um, it's been an excellent conversation. Um, I hope that some really positive things can come of this. I'd like to thank everybody who's turned out on a wonderful sunny afternoon uh, and made time for this event too. 
Um, this is the final day of WOW Film Festival 2021. I will release you to go and watch more films if you still have films left to watch. Um, and my tech team will also be very delighted to hear that I'll release them for the next event that's at 6.30. So um, sorry to uh, if we're going to rush off now and I'm sure we could talk for another hour or, or more. <laughs>